when lawyers are in litigation or doing trial work in court, we have special rules that apply um, that might not apply in other settings. And one of these is, some of these actually are related to the duty to be truthful or not to lie to the court and to judges. And that's the subject of ABA Model Rule 3.3, which we call candor to the tribunal. And candor to the tribunal. And essentially, this is a truth telling rule that it could outweigh your duty of confidentiality that might otherwise apply. So let's dive in. 3.3A1 starts by saying a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or fail to correct a false statement of material fact or law previously made to the tribunal by the lawyer. So just to step right, stop right there, you're not allowed <clears throat> either during um, uh, or in person court or oral argument or in your briefs to make up cases, for example, or um, uh, say that there's no statute in the state that governs a situation when there is, or say there's an exception out of the statute when there's not. Uh, so uh, this should be intuitively obvious that you're not allowed to make false statements about the law. You're also not allowed to just point blank lie to the court about the facts and say something that you know isn't true. Sometimes you may slip and say something, maybe you weren't thinking clearly or you misspoke, or maybe you had simply had the wrong information in your head. Somebody had, you were relying on what your client had told you or something you read that you realize later the next day isn't true. Well, if the proceeding is still going on, you actually have an affirmative duty to correct yourself to the court and not leave them with the wrong impression, even if you didn't mean to deceive or mislead them. Uh, this continues um, at 3.3a with part two, fail to disclose to the tribunal legal authority in the controlling jurisdiction known to the lawyer to be directly adverse to the position of the client and not disclosed by opposing counsel. Now, most of the time, the other lawyer is going to uh, be doing their own legal research and is going to make sure that they bring up every case or statute or constitutional provision that supports their side. But sometimes they miss things. And so let's say you're researching a reply brief and you come across a case to your dismay that's on point, it's binding precedent, and it's really unfatal to your client's claim or defense or something like that. It's just very clear and says that your client should lose. Well, and then you check and you realize that the other side never cited this. Well, you don't get to hide that case or pretend it doesn't exist. If the court is going to be bound by it, if the court could be reversed on appeal because of this case or this statute, you have to disclose it to the court, which means in trial, you're going to have to give a copy of it to the other side as well. Now, how did this happen that the other side missed something that's so beneficial to their side? Well, there are some lawyers out there who really do sloppy legal research or don't do, haven't done le legal research in a long time. Um, they uh, maybe are copying and pasting from previous briefs that they did in similar cases and, and not checking, doing updated research to make sure that the cases they're citing are still good law. All sorts of things happen like that. Um, that could mean that a lawyer is citing cases that are no longer good law or statutes that have since been amended and so forth. Or maybe they're citing that they look up the statute and cite the new version of the statute, and but it's an old version of the statute because the statute was recently amended that's going to control in the case, and the old version would have been better for them. Uh, well, in that case, again, it's controlling authority. You're going to have to disclose it. So uh, that may be hard and your client may not want you to, but uh, you, there's a rule that you have to. You can be subject to discipline if you don't. Okay, three, uh, you can't offer evidence that the lawyer knows to be false. If a lawyer, the lawyer's client, a witness called by the lawyer has offered material evidence and the lawyer comes to know of its falsity, the lawyer shall take reasonable remedial measures, including, if necessary, or as a last resort, telling on them, the disclosure to the client. And so you can't 
um, put someone on the stand, for example, and let them just lie, and you know for a fact that they're lying, that what they're saying is not true, and just let it stand or let it be entered into the record um, without correcting it. And if you know ahead of time that the client has given you, let's say, forged documents or fabricated um, uh, fake photos or things like that, you can't submit them as evidence. Um, it goes on to say that you can refuse to offer evidence, you may, other than the, the testimony of a defendant in a cr criminal matter that the lawyer reasonably believes is false. So even if you actually think it's the client is or the witness is lying, um, then it's permissive. You can refuse, you wouldn't be subject to discipline, or you can submit it. Because remember, the previous uh uh, the slide said that you n have actual knowledge that it's false. And this is saying if you reasonably believe it's false, then the, it's actually a judgment call that's up to you. Okay, let's go on to B. A lawyer who represents an, a client in an adjudicative proceeding and who knows that a person intends to engage or is engaging or has engaged in criminal or fraudulent conduct related to the proceeding shall take reasonable remedial measures, including if necessary disclosure to the tribunal. So if you find out that your client has been threatening jurors or bribing jurors, um, threatening uh, uh, someone related to the judge's clerk or bribing the judge's clerk or something like that, and it's your client doing it, then you actually either have to take some remedial steps to undo the damage, and that could mean telling on your client, even though that would be a breach of confidentiality. Okay. Um, C, the duty stated in paragraphs A and B continue to the conclusion of the proceeding. Let's stop right there. If you realize after the trial is over the next day, your client calls you and says, by the way, I lied to you and I really did it. I committed the crime or I gave you forged documents and got away with it or something. You don't have to correct it if the proceeding is over. and uh, But keep in mind that this rule that requires disclosures and truth-telling outweighs 1.6. In other words, it applies even if compliance of, uh, requires disclosure of information protected by the duty of confidentiality. On the MPRE, some of the hard questions give you a scenario, kind of like the ones we're talking about, and basically, the answer options ask you to pick between does the lawyer have to tell the truth and betray their client, or is they, are they not allowed to tell them because it's confidential information? If it's a 3.3 violation, 3.3 outweighs 1.6. That's what 3.3C says. Okay, 3.3, I'm sorry, um, we already talked about that. D, let's move on to D. In an ex parte proceeding, a lawyer shall inform the tribunal of all material facts known to the lawyer that will enable the tribunal to make an informed decision whether or not the facts are adverse. And so you could have a situation where the um, a, 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 the most common type of ex parte proceedings, of course, are preliminary injunctions. And this, when you go into court for a preliminary injunction or temporary restraining order, very often, this is kind of like an emergency stay or an emergency injunction. The other party isn't there. The other party will have an opportunity to get their day in court later if they want and contest everything you said. But because it's very common that you're the only side represented in the courtroom, you actually have a duty to be a little more fair. You can still argue for your side that your side should win. But if there's some offsetting fact that you know the other side would want the judge to know or if you think about it, would the judge be kind of mad or feel like you tricked them by strategically leaving something out? You actually have to go ahead and share that in the ex parte proceeding. Okay, I'm going to hit just a few of the highlights from the comments that I think could show up uh, as test questions or will help you on the MPRE. Rule 3.3 applies um, even in ancillary proceedings like depositions. So keep that in mind. You're not allowed to have your client lie in a deposition or submit false documents in a deposition, even though we're not in the courtroom yet. So it requires re remedial um, 
uh, measures if the lawyer discovers a client has offered false testimony during the deposition. Um, now, uh, also legal argument based on a knowingly false representation of law is dishonesty towards the tribunal. So don't get up and say there's a statute that favors us or there is no authority. This is a case of first impression in our state. The judge may not know all of this and um, they have to, we want to preserve the integrity of the tribunal. It also wastes everybody's time if the appellate court is going to be aware of what the law is and reverse the judge. It's embarrassing for the judge. So it, you could be subject to discipline for misrepresenting um, the law. Well, there's been cases at the time I'm recording this in the last year of lawyers using artificial intelligence like chat GPT to write their briefs. And you probably know this, but chat GPT will make up facts sometimes. Now, the problem is not, in my view, that the lawyer is using um, a, a, an AI program to help them write or improve their writing. It's that they're citing cases without checking them. Uh, if so, if you're going to cite a case, you need to look up every case that you're going to cite and make sure it's a real case and that it actually says what you're saying it says. Otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, you're in violation of Rule 3.3. Comment four goes on and says, you are not required to make a disinterested exposition of the law. It's okay if you are there to argue that the law favors your side, but you still have to recognize the existence of relevant legal authorities. You can't pretend they're not there, even if you think the authority on your side um, should be considered or that those cases that are unfavorable to you can be distinguished, or maybe they should be narrowed. Comment five goes on and says that you um, have to refuse to offer um, evidence that you know is false, regardless of the client's wishes, as we've already said. But it's not a violation if you have to submit evidence that, like a forged document, to prove that the other party committed forgery, or if you are bringing a claim of prosecuting someone for tax fraud, that you submit their fraudulent tax forms, things like that. Um, because even though in some philosophical sense you're submitting a false document into evidence, you're submitting it not to claim that it's true, but to show that the person created false documents or was forging documents or somehow committed fraud. Okay, and that concludes our initial overview about Law Rule 3.3. There's going to be a follow-up to this uh, video um, where we talk about some of the other rules with uh, the tribunal, candor to the tribunal, and specifically what to do when your client um, commits perjury.